The number one lie Satan wants people under the age of 50 to believe. There is a pervasive lie that the devil tells people under the age of 50 about their Christian walk with God. Unfortunately, many have believed this deception resulting in the loss of their eternal blessings. Over the years, I've witnessed the devil cunningly work his way into the hearts of individuals by convincing them that there is still plenty of time to serve God and that they can always choose to serve him later in life. However, in my opinion, this belief is a lie from the pit of hell. Why? One, you must understand that the devil is not the giver of life, so he can't determine how long anyone has to live. Two, the very essence of our creation is to serve God and honor him with our lives. Now is the time to ask yourself, what and who are you living for? Are you living for eternal things? Are you living for God? Or are you living for the here and now, as if this world is all that matters? I have heard people say, I am going to enjoy my 20s and 30s, and then, when I am 60 or 70, I will get serious with God. But are you certain about that? Tomorrow is not guaranteed. This is precisely the lie that the devil wants people to believe. I have time. It's crucial to remember that young people die just as old people do. Healthy people die, and so do sick people. Tomorrow is not promised to anyone. Now is the time to get your life right with the Lord. Wherever you are right now is the time. You could be on a bus right now listening to me, but you can still make things right with the Lord right now, wherever you are. You don't have to wait until you go to church or to your pastor. God will hear you this very second, this very minute. Talk to your father. How much time do you have left on earth? Today is the day you should get serious with God because old age is not promised to anyone. I've grown accustomed to hearing people say, I will serve God better when I grow older. I will do this and I will do that. This is the deceit the devil has planted in people's hearts to draw them away from the things of God. Of Life is so unpredictable your plans will not always come to fruition. There is the story of the rich fool who made plans for his life, for his old age, for his retirement, even for his 401k. But God tore those plans apart. Listen to me. God does not operate on our plan and our schedule. We operate on his timetable and his time. Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you. Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get? what you have prepared for yourself. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. This is how many people live their lives as if they have all the time in the world. This story exemplifies a man who believed the devil's lie that he had time. However, without any warning, God said, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. No warning, no prior notice. So, I have one question. Are you being a fool? Are you putting God in the back seat to indulge in sin? To enjoy the pleasures of sin? 
Are you relegating God to pursue wealth? God considers such actions foolish. Working hard and amassing wealth does not guarantee a long life. Similarly, being poor does not shorten your lifespan. That's why it amuses me to see people chasing after fleeting things in the hope that it will preserve their lives. You must understand that your lifespan is not determined by your wealth. As human life is not measured by the abundance of possessions, but by your dedication to your purpose. I therefore urge you to dedicate your life to serving God now, because now is the best time to do so. In a world that increasingly prioritizes material gain, instant gratification, and the pursuit of personal pleasures, the essential truth of our existence often gets obscured. We are reminded, through poignant narratives and divine warnings, of the transient nature of life and the fallacy of believing we have unlimited time. The tale of the man who fell prey to the devil's deception, believing he had ample time only to be confronted by God's judgment, serves as a stark reminder of this reality. It underscores a sobering truth. Life is fleeting, and no amount of wealth, pleasure, or worldly success can extend it. This narrative compels us to examine our priorities and the direction of our lives. Are we, like the man in the story, living under the illusion that there will always be more time? The pursuit of temporal joys and the accumulation of wealth often lead to a life lived in spiritual poverty, distant from the path God intends for us. The Lord's rebuke, labeling such a person a fool, is not just a condemnation of their choices, but a loving warning to all of us. It highlights the folly of sidelining eternal matters for fleeting worldly pleasures. God's message is clear. True wisdom lies in recognizing our mortality and responding to it by prioritizing our spiritual well-being and relationship with Him. The accumulation of wealth and the indulgence in sin may offer temporary satisfaction, but they cannot secure our souls nor guarantee another breath. The call to serve God now with urgency and sincerity is not merely an invitation, but a directive for a fulfilled life. Serving God transcends the temporal and places our lives within the context of eternity. As we navigate the complexities of life, let this reminder serve as a catalyst for change. May we shift our focus from the transient to the eternal, dedicating our lives to serving God and fulfilling our divine purpose. Let us not wait for a convenient time that may never come, but choose this day to walk in the light of His truth. For in the unpredictability of life, serving God now is the only guarantee we have. God has given himself freely to us in all aspects, including his image, and he expects us to do the same. Therefore, it is never too early to serve God, and one can never serve him too much. We need to ask ourselves periodically, how much time do we have left? Is it 30 years, 40 years, or 100? But God, in his infinite wisdom, has hidden this from us. We know we will die someday, but none of us know whether that day will come sooner or later. For some, it arrives unexpectedly early, just as they begin to find their footing in life. For others, they live longer than expected, perhaps without achieving much. However, this uncertainty shouldn't frighten us. Instead, it should inspire us to live well by dedicating ourselves to the service of God Almighty. Paulo Coelho once said, Life is too short or too long for me to allow myself the luxury of living it so badly. This statement captures the essence of our existence. Whether life is short or long, it should be lived meaningfully. The truth is, we don't know how much time we have left. If we did, perhaps we would take life more seriously. 
How much time do you have left? Is a question you should continually ask yourself. It astonishes me to see people living as though they are destined to live forever. Or as if this world is the only place humanity was created for, with nothing beyond. What do I mean by this? Simply put, the earth is not your final destination. You have another home to return to. A home where your deeds and impacts here will determine its nature. It's now up to you to make that home a place of comfort or a realm of eternal pain and condemnation. Mark 8.36 asks, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Anyone who lacks a relationship with God has, regrettably, surrendered their soul to the devil. Apart from the fact that no one knows how long they are destined to live, it is also certain that you cannot suddenly begin to do what you haven't trained yourself to do. The Bible says in Proverbs 22.6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This means for you to do anything qualitatively, you must have trained yourself in that thing. Serving God is one of the things you must teach yourself to do. It doesn't have to be convenient, you just have to do it. Serving God at the latter part of your life is a function of the training you have given yourself. If you haven't learned the discipline of serving God at a young age, it will be difficult and almost impossible to do so later in life because you haven't trained yourself that way. Take, for instance, a man who is used to the strip clubs, nightclubs, and casinos, and all sorts of other engagements all his entire life. A man like this will struggle to change his ways and start to attend church services, prayer meetings, all of a sudden because his flesh will remember. That old man in you will always want to go back to its sinful ways, its ways of the past. Every sin you have ever committed is remember by your flesh, and your flesh will continue to want to go back to that pleasure. So, when I hear people say, I will serve God when I am older, I always think to myself they are playing with fire. Sin is not something you should play, especially when you know it is wrong. Also, according to what people usually say, things don't get easier in the future. And the truth be told, that is the exact way it is. I want you to think about this. In your personal life and daily activities, the things you push and postpone often don't get done eventually. And even when they do, they're usually not done properly. Delaying your intimacy with God is an act you need to stop from right away because it has no good ending and in the end your service to God is all that matters. Every human on earth must come to this realization and give God their all in time to have a good ending. Serve God now, live for Him now and worship Him now because you can never tell what the future holds. I remember speaking to a man who had gone through a near-death experience. He was a believer in Christ and also a very affluent and accomplished businessman. And he said something which really struck me. He stated that being minutes away from death, being less than 10 minutes away from death, made him truly understand the verse, Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, and why the only thing Paul boasted on was the cross of Christ. This gentleman stated that during those testing moments when he did not know whether he was going to live or die, all he had to hold on to was the cross of Christ. Galatians chapter 6 verse 14, But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world had been crucified to me and I to the world. And this is true for all of us. We prioritize a lot of things, but when we are faced with eternity, the only thing that will matter is the cross of Christ. The only thing that will matter is the Lord Jesus Christ. In this man's situation, the business meeting that he had scheduled next week became insignificant. It became 
a complete and utter distant afterthought to him. And we can learn a lot from this situation. The things we prioritize in this life mean nothing when we are faced with eternity. This man did not think about making money, nor did he think about his favorite basketball team. No, all that mattered to him at that moment was the cross of Christ. His job became insignificant. His home that he purchased and that he was very proud of became insignificant. His 401k became insignificant. The truth is, death comes to us all one by one, and the day it comes, all the things you prioritized over the cross of Christ will become insignificant. And you know, you know this because your consciousness tells you that this is true, and yet you do not prioritize God. What happens when we die? Is there a such thing called purgatory? Do we just go to sleep until the resurrection? Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. There is no purgatory in the word of God. The Bible tells us after death, there is a judgment. And once an individual knows there is a judgment coming, they cannot live the same. Once you know that your life will be reviewed by a holy eternal God, you cannot live the same. Once you know that even the very words you speak will be analyzed, examined, and reviewed, you cannot live the same. Judgment is coming. It is coming. Psalm 91.5 Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever Thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, Thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood, they are as a sleep. In the morning they are like grass, which groweth up. Let us go through this passage, as a man thinks about the final moments before death. Psalm 91.5 Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever Thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, Thou art God. This man, this prophet, this great leader Moses, as he sees his friends, colleagues and relatives die, his heart claims tremendous comfort in knowing that whoever else comes, and whoever else goes, his God is always there as his home. And in that moment of consideration of death, his heart went out in prayer to God and found comfort. That is something for us to do each and every day, to remember the eternity of God, but the temporary nature of human life. Thousands of years before you and I were born, billions of people have come and billions of people have gone. And God has been a dwelling place for them. He is the God of all generations. And even when you are gone from this earth, He will continue to be the God of generations. With all the thousands and even tens of thousands, with all the hundreds of thousands of people who are watching and listening to me now, one day, soon only one of us will be left on this earth and he or she will pass into eternity. But whoever comes and goes from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God, and that God is the home of his people. This psalm is a meditation on the eternal nature of God in contrast to the frailty of human life. Psalm 93 says, Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men. The amplified translation of this verse states, Psalm 93. You turn man back to dust and say, Return to the earth, O children of mortal men. This verse is a reminder of human mortality and the transient nature of human life in comparison to the everlasting nature of God. The phrase, Return to dust, echoes the judgment upon Adam in Genesis 3.19, after the fall. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. It speaks to the common destiny of all human beings. We come from dust, and to dust we shall return. In this way, 
The psalmist acknowledges the power of God over life and death, and the reality that human life is fleeting. We are dust, and to dust we will return. This one verse tells us that your life and my life are in the hands of God. At His decree and at His call, our bodies will be instructed to go back to dust. For each and every person who has ever lived and died, it is the decree of God that has removed them from this world. This is why it is important to remember that your life is not in your own hands. The parable of the rich fool is a story told by Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, specifically found in Luke 12, 16, 21. Here's a summary of the parable. A rich man's land produced a bountiful crop, so much so that he didn't have enough space to store his crops. He decided to tear down his barns and build bigger ones to store all his grain and goods. He then told himself that he had plenty of goods laid up for many years and that he could take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. However, God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? The parable concludes with the moral that this is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. The sudden end of the rich man's life serves as a stark reminder that despite one's plans and perceived control over their life, the duration of one's life is ultimately not in their hands. It is in God's. You can be on this earth one minute, and the next you can be in eternity. The man in the parable focused solely on his wealth and comfort, without consideration for his spiritual well-being or the needs of others. His life was demanded of him unexpectedly. Judgment is coming. It is coming. And on this judgment, there is one thing that separates people's eternal destination. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Once again, this word cross comes up. The cross separates all of mankind. First, it came up in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, as being the only thing that the apostle could boast on. And now this word, quote, the cross, has come up again. As we, there is a dividing line between those who are perishing and those who are being saved. The cross of Christ is why our sins have been forgiven. The cross. Galatians chapter 6 verse 14. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The Apostle Paul begins with the statement, quote, God forbid, meaning literally, may it never come to be, that I may boast on anything other than Christ. What Paul is telling us here is look to Jesus, look to the cross, look unto the author and finisher of our faith. Unfortunately, there are a lot of things this world wants you to look unto except the cross. This world wants you to look at yourself and your goodness, and religion wants you to look at your righteousness. Allow me to focus on these two things. 1. The world wants you to look at yourself and your goodness. The world we live in wants you to boast in how much of a good person you are. I am a good person. I pay my bills. I support my community. I look after my family. I obey the law. I am nice. I am kind. I am loving. I am a really good person. This is how most of the world and unbelievers view themselves as good people. They do not see themselves as sinners who are heading towards hell. They only view criminals who have killed someone or committed a robbery as sinners. This is why a lot of unbelievers have a problem with the gospel message, because the gospel message points the finger at you, 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 and me, and tells each and every one of us that we are all sinners. It is not only those who are criminals who are sinners, it's not only those who have committed some hideous, evil crime who are sinners. Each and every one of us are sinners who have offended a holy God. The truth is, people don't like to hear that about themselves. 
I am not a sinner, I'm a good person. This is why the gospel message offends people, because the gospel message is direct and very blunt and tells us all directly that we are sinners. Yet this world will want you to look at yourself and your own goodness, and they believe the devil's lie that you don't need the message of the cross. Therefore, the message of the cross is foolishness to them. 2. People look at their own righteousness. Unfortunately, there are churchgoers who will be surprised at the day of judgment because they are focusing and boasting on themselves rather than the message of the cross. They are so holy in their own eyes that they deserve to go to heaven. They are so holy in their own eyes that heaven is not heaven without them. They are so holy in their own eyes, they begin to boast to God about how good they are. Religion. They are not followers of Christ, but rather followers of religion. They are not children of God, but rather they are children of religion. Allow me to say that one more time. They are so holy in their own eyes, they begin to boast to God about how good they are. Does this not remind you of the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector? Luke chapter 18 verses 9 through 14. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as these other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Do you see this Pharisee exalted himself? He had the audacity to boast to God about himself. But notice that Paul said, The only thing I can boast of is Christ. Yet this Pharisee, in all of his pride and self-importance, was giving a lecture to God about how good he is. I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Can you imagine? Can you imagine stepping into the presence of the Lord and boasting about how good you are? Do you remember in the year King Uzziah died, Isaiah high and lifted up? The first thing, the first thing prophet of the Lord said after seeing the Lord was, Isaiah chapter 6 verse 5 Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah saw his own sinfulness, yet this Pharisee went ahead and boasted in himself. Remember what I stated earlier. Unfortunately, there are a lot of things this world wants you to look at except the cross. 1. This world wants you to look at yourself and your goodness. 2. And religion wants you to look at your righteousness. However, the prophet here tells us, God forbid that we should boast in anything else. Galatians chapter 6 verse 14, But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. Within the Galatian letters, Jesus Christ is mentioned over 40 times, which means that one-third of the verses contain some reference to him. This right here is the Christian life, and the apostle reveals it to us. The person of Jesus Christ captivated Paul, and it was Christ who made the cross glorious to him. It was who Christ is and what he did for us that made the cross glorious to Paul. Who is Christ? And what did he do for us? Christ, the only begotten Son of God, and what he did was live a perfect life and become the propitiation of our sins. He died the death of all deaths for our sins. Make a commitment today 
not to be like the world and boast in your own goodness. Make a commitment today not to be like a religious person and boast in your own righteousness. But make a commitment today to be a child of God that boasts in the cross of Christ. Back to the man I told you about at the start of the sermon. When death came knocking at his door, and when he was only minutes, minutes away from judgment, all he could hold on to is Jesus Christ and the cross of Christ. This is a sobering message. This is a humbling message. This is a serious message. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. It is an appointment that all men and women must keep. Who fixes the appointment? God is the one who fixes the appointment. And you and I do not know when your appointment or my appointment will be. But one thing is for sure, the appointment is coming. God has made an appointment for each man and each woman, an appointment for each boy and woman, and the appointment is called death. And when this appointment comes, what will really matter? What will a person boast of? What are you boasting about? Are you boasting about how good and wonderful your life is on earth? Are you boasting about how good and holy you are? Are you boasting about material possessions? The cold hard truth, the cold hard truth that you will not hear in most pulpits across our nation is the only thing that matters and that will matter to you when you are about to step into eternity is the cross of Christ. Hold on to Jesus as he holds on to you. All that will matter in those minutes leading up into entering eternity is the name of Jesus, the sweet name of Jesus. He is the only way to the Father. He is the only way to the kingdom of God. He is the one.